All right, we are live on YouTube. How are you doing, Chris? I am well, Will. Thanks for joining us on MarketChameleon.com webinar with Mr. Silver, Chris Marcus from Arcadia Economics. We are starting our Zoom presentation now. We had 1,000 registered for this because of Chris's background in the silver trade. And uh, Dee, thanks for joining us. Good to see you. Chris? Thanks, Will. I'm going to keep... Myself, I have background noise right now. There's an al alarm bell no going worries. on. So I'm no going to keep it on mute while while it's on. Once it comes off, I'm, I'm going to unmute. Perfect. Uh, Chris, I'm so glad we got you. And we only have Chris for half an hour because he's super busy right now. Anyone who hasn't been following Chris, we've had him on probably five times since we've been in business. And he's been talking about this silver potential for probably two years now three years, Chris, you got to remind me how long we're, but, on, we're on year 10 on that part, buddy. <laughs> it hasn't been 10 years that we've been talking together though. Yeah. I think at, at the most it's three. You've Anyways, been, Chris, you've been putting up with me for three. So that is true. Chris helped my retirement fund. Cause I bought uh, a little bit of SLV when I first talked to him. Cause I was like, I better have something in my account. And I think it's up, I don't know, two, 300% since then. But well, you're thinking about converting that to physical soon, Will, right? <laughs> Who knows? Who yeah. knows? But we've got participants coming in. This is a Zoom-led meeting. We also on our YouTube live, our marketchameleon.com channel. So for everyone on Zoom, put your questions in the Q&A or the chat on the YouTube live. Uh, just put in the chat and I will try to get to them. Tonight we are going to be uh, tight for time. So Chris, start by telling us a little bit how you got into this trade. What made you first look at it? Well, uh, Really that after I was sitting on the American Stock Exchange and then New York Stock Exchange uh, equity option market maker and then hit me one day while the whole subprime bubble was melting down. I just graduated from Wharton's MBA program, was working on the floor. I'm like, gee, aren't I, aren't I the guy that was kind of trained to see this stuff in advance yet? I was as blindsided as everybody else at the time, which I don't think is an accident. Maybe that's what the system teaches yet. Fortunately, I was thinking, well, all right, you know, Bernanke's saying subprimes contained. He couldn't spot it even as it was happening. And then I started hearing, well, there was a couple of people who did see this in advance. And most of them talked about gold. We saw the movie The Big Short, where you saw what they looked at. And really, it led me to Austrian economics, understanding what Wall Street and Wharton don't teach what I think is actually a lot more important than what they do teach. And uh, if you like gold, I don't know. I think if you like gold, you have to like silver. And it was it just been fixated on it because then in 2011, by the time QE2 started, you know, I'd been trading equity options for a while and was researching into gold and silver. And so I had some big option positions on GLD and SLV, which on the way up, was a lot of fun on the way down. It was a learning experience, yet that was 10 years ago, yet I I was left thinking either, because something didn't add up, it didn't make sense to me why the price came down. Well, basically, I mean, you could call QE2 hyperinflation, let alone what we've tacked on now. So essentially, I thought either A, there's some explanation I can't see, or B, if natural demand was driving the price of silver to 50, and the only reason it got hammered was because a bunch of banks that Department of Justice now officially labels criminal enterprises just sold a bunch of paper silver that they don't own, and to the degree that many experts feel it's leveraged as much as 500 to one, we can talk about some of the metrics there. And but I thought if that's the only reason it went lower based on my studies of markets, my experience trading and study of history is thinking, well, I guess for the last decade I was left with that seems like the floor. I don't really know how you price something when it's that distorted, but that's where it began. And uh, you can <laughs> take it from there, I guess. So when you first thought about this trade, I mean, you, and you've been talking about it for a while. Did you ever see like this populist movement coming from, I mean, they're talking about Reddit now and people, you know, people getting in because they want to, you know, get it, get it back at the man. Is, is that the trade or is it literally 
that you thought fundamentally the uses for silver, the need for silver would drive prices? Is it a combination of the items? What What is the reason that you first got into the move? And more importantly, I guess for chameleons, at least for me, this chameleon is where do you see it going from here? We, we just hit a, you know, a 52 week high in SLV. I mean, Dimitri and I were looking at unusual option volumes on Friday and we both kicking ourselves because we saw, I don't know, two or three of the miners had some crazy call activity. We did nothing, sat on our hands and they were up big this morning, I think. Was it this? Uh, D's got background noise, but it, I think it was this morning we talked about it. So, I mean, is there upside from here? Was this the move? What What are you thinking? Yeah, well, some great questions in there. I think there's a lot of upside. I do think we've entered a new phase where I don't think this is reversible at this point, which is not to say we'll have $50 silver this week, but um, I'll explain why there. Although one thing that I might, I guess, since we're talking options here would be well worth pointing out and I'll pull up our silver chart today so we can take a look at that as we go. But Will, I know as you're well familiar with and some others who have studied options, today would probably not be the day to buy call options. You know, if you're of the view that there is a long-term move coming or even shorter term, because right now the price of the, the silver price or the SLV or the minor stock price is higher, but also the vols are extremely jacked. We can pull up the, the first Majestic board um, it's funny. I remember a couple of weeks ago, we did a webinar and someone asked about the, you know, getting the long-term options, you know, they have 2023s, which expired two years from now, 25 strike was the highest they had. I remember, cause we were looking at it and I think it paid two thirty on those. Now I think those are like nine or 10 bucks and they've added the 30 strike. So if you're betting, especially even in it's interesting vol surface, well, actually, maybe if you want to pull up the board, it'd be interesting to take a look at because front month vols are incredibly high. And so right now, if you bought call options today, it's not that you can't win, but it's like you almost need a massive move because the way... Uh, and Dimitri, I'd be curious your opinion on this. I never thought of this when I was back at Susquehanna, but I've been thinking about it last couple of days in particular and reflecting the last couple of years where it's like the way volatility gets priced is kind of an ineffective lagging indicator. Because let's say we wake up, uh, something happens tonight and uh, the futures are down 5%. Let's say that, you know, silver gets out of control and people are worried about some of these... Uh, highly leveraged banks that short silver, which might be a good thing to look into. But let's say, you know, the market's down. When the market opens here in the US, the price is already down, but the vols are jacked. The vols are high, but it's like you're paying that level for what just happened. So if you buy the vol then, in fact, that's kind of when I like well, I'm working on getting a setup where I can sell vol again, which will be fantastic. But, and Will, can we talk more about that offline, please, sir? Um, All right. But Dimitri, do you get what I'm saying? Where it's like, because if the stock market's down 5%, it'd be great. Yeah, if you could pay that vol before the move, but it's already happened. And now it's actually, you know, again, not legal financial advice, but often a good time to sell because that's when the volatility is jacked. And unless you have another move even bigger than that, that's when selling vol and inversely, the same concept would apply to the, uh, the call options and you can pull up the bar and look at that. Um, Dimitri, any thoughts on that one? Actually, b before we go any further, I don't know if Dima still has his background noise, but D, we may want to go through the disclaimer. We forgot to do that at the start of the show. I'd like to hit that. What do you think? Uh yeah, like I said, I might mute it just because yeah. there's an alarm that's going off Yep, back, back and forth. So I just kept myself on mute so you don't hear that. But yeah, guys, we did forget the disclaimer that, you know, Will and I, Chris, 
Market Chameleon, we're not registered investment advisors or broker dealers. We're not telling you what to do. We're just sharing our ideas. Uh, if you need professional help, call your broker. That's what they're there for, to help provide you with guidance, um, help answer your questions. So there's the disclaimer. Um, Perfect. Well, thanks for reminding me, Chris. May, you may I add disclaimer. something to that disclaimer, Will? Yes. By all means, this is completely different, what we're talking about in this particular moment than buying physical silver. I'm happy to take questions. And Will, I, I know uh, you wanted to open it up to questions as much as possible today. Yeah, we option questions. And it's it's an incredible way of speculating, but it's uh, most for most people, it's an unsuitable level of risk. And I don't want to make any uh, confusion about that. But with that said, now, if you want to talk yeah, about well, I guess one of the things that I that I heard and they had like on CNBC today, they had silver dealers on who said they cannot get access to silver. Why is that happening? I mean, is there such I mean, because Dimitri and I talked about it. We were looking at the fundamental and silver is used in so many industrial products. It seems like uh, very strange that all of a sudden, just because there's this, this short, quote unquote, short squeeze, I don't even know if it really is a short squeeze, but this interest and demand that kind of is flowing off of what happened with GameStop, uh, the Reddit group, uh, AMC, and now has seemed to migrate to silver. Why is that affecting silver to these bullion dealers? I, I didn't really understand that. Well, I'm looking for something that to pull up here. And Dimitri, could I grab the screen share again? Uh, I think you have it. It's I don't think I have the screen share. Everyone's got it. You just go to the bottom and it says share screen. Uh, uh, but I'm not sharing. Am I sharing my? No. Who's sharing the screen? I Will, got you're it. sharing oh, your all screen. All right. Let me, let me stop my share. I, I got it. All right. You guys see the Twitter feed here? Yep. This woman shaking her toilet paper around. Reason I pull this up, uh, Will, I think you know this. Uh, I have a partnership with Miles Franklin, which is a precious metals dealer. So this way, at least, you know, not people wanted to know, get, know they're getting metal. That's where we send them to. So I asked Jana Schechtman of Miles Franklin, who is the uh, co-owner, if today was far and away the most silver they've ever sold in the history of the company. And she just wrote back, it's like toilet paper in 2020. Uh, I can confirm my partner, uh, Yara, who handles that part of the inquiries we get for silver bullion purchases has been, we've had to have someone else take over because it's just too much. So uh, let's see if we can pull up another data point here. I mean, does that just seem odd to anyone else or just to me? Dima? What's that, Wills? Well, let, 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 there's like this, all of a sudden, you know, it seemed to me that it was like a a Reddit commentary about the shorts in SLV and the gold, not like some sort of squeeze on the precious. I mean, metal. I, th I think that added to the pressure of it. Yeah, but that's how you I squeeze them. This, yeah, yeah, but I, I don't. I mean, I think that that it's there is fundamental reasons why silver is going up. Just. For the same reason we're seeing even the the digital currencies going up is I think that there's right now going to be a lot of pressure on metals potentially. This is my you know my opinion, like you said, because the the amount of money that we're pushing out right now is is an incredible amount of money that they're just printing. You know, like this wasn't this isn't the same as because we have the world economy kind of slowing down, you know, production going down and money get, so you got more money, less goods being produced and their solution is to print more money every time. And I think we've seen yes. this kind of inflation before in, even in the U S you know, we've seen hyperinflation and, and Chris would, would be interesting is that silver, it's not just a hedge against inflation, but this is, actually used in manufacturing in a lot of products. I know, you know, I've been reading even in, in, and you mentioned this before, in cell phones, semiconductors, so solar panels, um, almost, you know, everyday products that we use and buy, silver is an input, is an input um, into those products. 
So, you know, they're, they're, and I think that that may create a lot of pressure. And the way the metals work, kind of like oil, is like they'll go up, they'll go up, but they like crashed. It's like the opposite way. They could crash to the upside. Like the market could crash to the downside. They could crash to the upside. You know, and that's a little bit different than a stock, although we did see a crash to the upside in uh, GameStop. Yeah. But yeah. in in commodities, we've seen, you know, that's what, what happens. In, it's happened in history. We've seen it in oil. We've seen it in metals before. Um, and, you know, I think that there's, that there's actually legitimate reason behind this, this push in silver. You know, I don't think it's Reddit doing it, put it this It would be very hard, you know, Reddit could potentially, I don't know, move a, a stock that has 5 million or 10 million float, but I don't think Reddit could w- move the world markets in silver. You know, I don't think that's what's happening, Will, is that I don't think it's the Reddit message board. I do think that there is a fundamental reason behind this move. Yeah, absolutely. That that's what I've been <laughs> sitting here telling anyone who would listen for the last 10 years. With that said, clearly there's been some spark in the last week. Now, Dimitri, you raise a very astute point, being the brilliant option trader that you are, that is it Reddit? <clears throat> is it something else? Uh, is it the attention that's been placed? I mean, we, we had silver manipulation on the cover of CNBC and the Wall Street Journal. I mean, I thought we had a better chance of finding aliens than ever seeing the mainstream report on this. So, you know, a lot of it, I mean, now it's almost become like a, a wild media event. It reminds me of the OJ chase where and maybe it's not that big yet, although I think has the potential to be that big be, because like you mentioned, I don't know much about GameStop. I'm guessing fundamentally it's not worth $500 a share. Right. But we saw what happened when something gets squeezed. I mean, on the other case, I think you can make a, you know, we'll, we'll leave aside what a fundamental valuation of silver is for the moment, but, you know, where maybe GameStop to 500 was going against gravity. I would assert that for folks who had a fuller picture of what's hap- been happening beneath the surface, you know, you're allowing gravity just to do its thing by letting silver be freed. Now, I have uh, I'm not ready to share yet because I'm still researching it. I have some thoughts about what could be behind this move uh, and all this attention. I think I'd like to confirm and research a little more. I think I know how I would end up feeling, but that aside, whoever's buying it, I mean, there's, there's hashtags, silver squeeze now, you know, I'm, like, I'm seeing like people change, everyone's tweeting messages to me and they have silver squeeze in their name and the message. It's like, uh, it's like a rock concert where it's like people are talking about silver in the span of days and again, you know, okay, fine. You could say we have people talk about a lot of things. What, what does it matter? Although, A, I would point out if there's ever been a barometer of psychology, I would suggest financial markets are it. And I might add, this is in the same time period we've seen Tesla go up 19x, Bitcoin 10 to 15x, uh, GameStop 25x in a couple of weeks. You know, so, so there's, yes, the, the fundamentals and all these things now, they've been there for a while. Now, while we can debate, you know, what's really behind the the minutia of the spark, clearly there's some spark here. And again, you know, maybe none of that really in the end matters, except what are people doing with their money? So uh, I will, uh, I'm sure in the next couple of days, maybe I'll have some more numerical data. But for now, in terms of the physical level, I'd say this is representative of other dealers too. I think that I'm very careful of the way I phrase things. I think that would be appropriate to say, maybe they wouldn't put the woman dancing with her toilet paper, but that's what the owner of the shop said. And I checked with her. I said, are you sure it's okay that I quote you? She said, yes. And I think it's reflective. Another metric we can look at is that on Friday, 
I was stunned when this came out Friday night. In fact, I'd been, you know, recording, talking silver, making videos all day. And I, I was just about ready. I'm like, okay, I can't do any more. But then I saw this. It was shocking. And I'd like to give Bob Coleman uh, credit for uh, Bob Coleman, gold and silver analyst who talks about these issues as well. He was the first one that pointed that out that, you know, how many ounces or SLV, basically, they say they're adding silver to the trust, which hopefully they are. They are. I don't know for sure. I have some questions if, but do you know how many shares were added on Friday? Will, why don't you take a guess on that one? <laughs> how many shares or to the which, SLV? Which, yeah, which represents an ounce of silver for each share. Oh my God. Uh, 100 million? Not that much, although not, <laughs> not, you're not <laughs> far off. On Friday, and I'll put it in context for you, on Friday, it was 34 million shares added, which means 34 million ounces. Now, here we have a report from the Silver Institute. It was an update with their supply and demand. So here we're looking at 2020 expected. This was a couple months ago. So you had the mine shut down last year. So mining supply in the top line. Hey, Chris, I, I just want to confirm because it's uh, uh, we got a question about where you're getting this data from that you're on right now. And I'm, I'm looking up top. It looks like the silverinstitute.org. Is that correct? Yeah, this one, if you go to, uh, you got to search under news and events, Silver Institute press release. And then it's, uh, I believe this one, 2020 release of Silver Institute interim. Now again, uh, oh, yeah, okay, then we click here and then scroll down. So they put this out, let's see, is there a date? Um, November 17th, so yeah, it's about two months old. Excellent, that was super helpful, that was for Jake. Hey, listen, Chris, I wanna thank uh, you for inviting the Chris Marcus Silver Army over. We've never had so many people watching live at one time on our YouTube channel. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, Chris is a great friend of the show and welcome. And if you came late, I will send the video to Chris so he can distribute it to you. And it will also sits live on our YouTube channel. So you can go back and get what you missed. But again, the Chris Marcus army is on in full force uh, okay. right now. But what is that? So Chris, what is that? That is this chart. It's showing the supply versus the demand metrics year by year. Yeah, so what, what, there's a couple of ways of looking at it, and I'll share my reaction Friday night, and then when I thought a little bit more about it Saturday was, I think that was a moment I'll remember for years or decades, because when I thought about it a little differently, that was what somehow clicked in my mind that whatever is happening here, I find it hard to see how it's reversed, and to explain that, here we see total supply in this column or row here, rather. So 962 million ounces, that's close to a billion. So basically, Will, if you have 34 million ounces, let's round a little bit, times three is about 100 million ounces, right? Correct. So if you did, if that pace on Friday continued for three days, that would be 100 million ounces, right? Yep. So if you did it for 30 days would be a billion ounces, right? Seems, seems right. So just the, if the SLV, if the amount of shares being purchased at that pace over 30 trading days, you would eat the entire annual supply of silver. 30 days. Wow. But then here's what I thought about, uh, it was, fun. it was nice. I was calling my mom and, you know, that's right. Kids at home, call your mom. And, you know, which is always helpful because, you know, it's, that's how I always try and think of things, explain it. So my mom could understand it, which forces me to helps clarify it in my own mind because yeah, I think that, you know, they took one thirtieth of the annual supply in one day is uh, pretty shocking, but perhaps even more significantly, is that when you have a billion ounces here, most of that's already accounted for. So here, 466 industries. So Dimitri, like he said, 
cell phones. I mean, so you could say we have a billion ounces, but if we're going to continue using electronics next year, you're not going to get a billion ounces. And leaving aside whether the industrial users, it's interesting to think what they must be thinking as they're watching this and knowing that they don't have silver, they don't make their products. Apple doesn't make its laptops. Apple doesn't make its iPhones. So we'll leave that aside though. So 466, let's round that up to 500 when you add in photography, 650 with jewelry, let's call it 700 with, if you add in silverware. So seven out of that 10 is accounted for right. unless we stop using electronics, which I don't think is going to happen. It's probably gonna go up. Chris, I mean, would you be able to show us where you, you mentioned that, that SLV when you saw an increase in the amount, how do, can you show the viewers how you, where you see that information? Like if our viewers wanted to track that and, you know, to see if it's in, you know, if the shares or the amount. Of I can how uh, somewhat show you, I wasn't able to get their file to download on my Mac the other night, but if you go to the iShares site, Yep. You see here, download. I'll give it a shot today and see if we, because uh, what's interesting is that apparently today, another uh, asked Bob again, right before it came on here, he said another 20 million ounces went in. So slow down a little bit. Um, anyway, uh, that's where you can find that file. And by all means, yes, please go verify this. Feel free to verify. Although I think we're gonna get that thing pulled up here in a second. Right. Um, in other words, we, you could see it, it's not just the trading, just so people understand, because if people are trading back and forth, you might not be creating more shares, right? You're not creating more ETFs. But if there's a much larger demand where there's buyers and lack of sellers going back and forth, what happens is you have to create more and more shares. OK. Um, and. And when you do, that's where the ETF has to go out. And are they buying physical silver? Is that what happens when they create more shares or are they doing the futures? What are they doing? That is the key question, my friend. According, I actually did call them a couple of years. So at least I could hear someone say, yes, they, they say they put the metal in the trust. There are a lot of questions. And I mean, I'm not sure how confident investors are supposed to feel when the custodian just was labeled a criminal enterprise, their precious metals trading desk and find $920 million for manipulating the treasury and precious metals markets on hundreds of thousands of occasions. CFTC's words, not mine. So they're supposed to have the metal in there. I steer clear of business deals when JP Morgan's involved and uh, maybe the metal's there, but it, I find usually when you deal with criminals, whether they screw you in the way you expect or they screw you in a way that you don't see. There's a lot of questions, but if we can leave that aside for the moment, just, uh, and I know then we'll have a couple minutes left, we can open up to questions. <clears throat> just to finish putting that in perspective, the 34 million. So if 700 is accounted for, and then here you have net physical investment, last year was 236.8. Okay, so if we just heard that dealers are saying today that when you ask them, is this the most you ever sold? And they say it's like toilet paper after Corona. I'm assuming this isn't coming down probably this year, especially, I mean, because before even this happened, you have Janet Yellen who's, who's traded, uh, they threw in a couple draft picks, sent her into the treasury. And now, even though with a Fed balance sheet at $8 trillion, she wants us to go big. So, I mean, even before this, you're probably going to see some moves this year. I think it's like last year. The things were going to happen. Corona was the event. But these things were going to... And reminds me a lot of that, which we'll leave aside for now. But hard to see this number coming down. And these... You know, we have the green, the Biden green administration, more solar panels, more electric. So I don't see these guys backing off of their cut. 
Now that adds up to 930. Let's call it 931. So while you can look down here, this 350 number, that's net investment in ETPs, exchange traded products. So at first I was thinking, well, 34 million, they 10% of what went in last year, which was a record year. So last year was a record year for the amount of silver that went into trusts like SLV. By far, look, you had 81, negative 22, 50. Even back in 2011, it was negative 18. Here, I remember when I interviewed Ted Butler for the Big Silver Short book, he thought that the driver in 2011 was that after Ben Bernanke launched QE2, 60 million ounces went into SLV, and that was what he felt was the main driver sending silver to 50 bucks. Okay, last year you blew that away. And then in one, the first day of the silver squeeze movement, you ate a tenth of what you had last year, but here's the thing. There was a deficit last year. So pretty much if you want to say of the available supply that goes, that would be at least according to last year's number, what would be available for the silver trust if you don't think industry is slowing down and we see that physicals in slowing down, that means if 931 is accounted for out of 962, so at last year's numbers, that would mean for the entire year, 31 million ounces would be available for SLV and the Silver Trust. And on Friday, on day one of the movement, you had 34, so you already eclipsed what was available last year. You tacked on another 20 today. And we know we live in a world where Funds chase momentum. They buy after things have gone up. And Will and Dimitri, we talked about this before. When tech shares are hot and silver is sitting there, I mean, the fundamentals were glaring in 2011. The money printing only accelerated, but it's one. Of, that's where the psychology comes in. Now that it's a a national event, I mean, you have Wall Street Journal, CNBC. They wouldn't talk. They didn't. I didn't know they knew how to spell silver. And now the, the, the supply that was available, it was eaten in a day and they're buying physical silver like it's toilet paper. So whether that's Reddit, whether that's people who have been watching Reddit, whether that's new hedge funds or investment funds, like I wonder, uh, in fact, I will, I think I'm talking to one of my old friends at Susquehanna tonight. I am darn curious what they are doing because that's a shop where you know, if you really wanted, let's say you, uh, you were, you're like in Will's status, you had like two or $3 billion and you wanted to hire the smartest people you could to execute a short squeeze. I mean, that's who I would pick. And I'm curious what shops like them are looking at because It's one thing, you know, fine, you have the silver bugs or the people worried about inflation when they buy, but when you get away from, now it doesn't matter about sound money or whether people like silver. Now there's money on the table. There's blood in the water. And even if the price got hammered two or $3 tomorrow, because people understand why now there's been the, the secret that this was always based on has been exposed I don't see how that can be put back in. I think if you saw the price smash tomorrow, that probably would end it because I think people would buy so much metal because they know it and they would call, basically the banks have been bluffing and now it's getting called and I don't know which day it will happen or which day it will break loose, but I don't know. Maybe I'll see it differently tomorrow. As of today, I don't see how this is reversed. Well, we have a question from, uh, can you take a question? You, we've only got you. Actually, we don't have you. You're four minutes over right now. You have a few minutes for questions? Got till 45 today for you, Will. All right, perfect. We, this is from uh, Jake, and he's asking, are silver futures markets predominantly sellers looking to lock in? Uh, they're like miners looking to lock in, or are they just tons of speculators? And do you know the split between actual people hedging silver positions and what is speculators in uh, the futures market? 
Yeah, that's it's a great question. Um, I know sometimes people say, you know, these short positions hedged. I mean, there's some room for debate. I guess there was one fellow I talked with who was disputing that there's a large short position because the banks get silver from the, the refinery or the miner. So they're holding silver. So before they send it to their end user, yeah, I could see a case to be made for hedging there. Um, now at the same time is the end user hedging his position, which would theoretically offset the bank's hedge. Someone is short somewhere. There's two sides to these contracts. So someone is short. And I guess here's the thing is that you can look at the COT report that claims the four largest traders are short whatever percent of the open interest, which backs out to 292 million ounces of silver. So if there's no offsetting hedge, or whether it's theirs or whether somebody is net short that metal, which somebody I would think has to be, then that means for every dollar silver goes up, they're sharing a $292 billion loss. Silver goes up $3, that's a $900 billion, a million dollar loss. You know what's interesting? The, that chart that you showed us, you know, for the last 10 years, it looked like the supply and demand has been pretty stable. It doesn't really fluctuate. We haven't seen any really big disruption in that. Like, what do you think the capacity is for these miners to increase production? Let's say that that we needed 10, you know, what if this the the demand went up by 10%? What if what if that happened? Do they have that capacity just to switch it on? Like, you know, like Saudi Arabia just when, when we need more oil, they just pump it out. How does it work in the, in the silver industry? Great question, Dimitri. I think everybody who's watching is going to love the answer because fortunately enough, I had Brad Cook of Endeavor Silver. It's a great silver company that I'm a fan of. And he came on my show a couple of weeks ago and he's actually part of the Silver Institute. And he actually discussed that because uh, I don't remember their production numbers. I think first Majestic Silver, it's between like 20 to 30 million ounces a year that they produce. And they're one of the biggest ones. I mean, now there's some projects that get turned on at a higher price, but I guess the way Brad phrased it is that, you know, maybe they, the, the silver companies get a, new, a few new projects, expedite some things, you get 20 or 30 million extra ounces. It's, I guess the... To put it, the short answer is no, it doesn't move the needle. And in fact, Brad mentioned this. A lot of the folks I've spoken with mentioned this is that they all expected that the net driver in price comes down to investment demand. Because like you point out, these numbers are pretty stable. Now I would say that over time and all the projections, especially in a more electronic green world, everyone seems you know, what is it, California last year now, solar panels on every house. So I think there's a, I've not yet heard anyone make the case of the demand outside of economic forces, perhaps going down. So no, you can't just, even if the miners try and crank it up, I think Brad's exact words were it barely moves the needle. Right, because they're too small for the miners, to... but if you need silver, right, it's going to be hard to come by. Because you had that's we that's why I pointed out here. Really, the what was available was thirty-two million ounces. So this is pretty static. I my feeling, and when I study the numbers, was always this seemed like pretty tight. So when you top pop in three fifty here, and then now you get. 50, you got a seventh of that in two days. So uh, ho hopefully that puts it in perspective. Well, actually, there are, there are quite a few comments on the chat about how hard it is to ramp up uh, production at mines. It's, it's not just like digging more holes, right? It's, uh, it's a, a big undertaking. We did have a question, D. I don't know if, you, if you're able to share your screen. Uh, but someone at, Chris had mentioned uh, the the skew 
or the surface? Uh, someone was asking within the Market Chameleon website, is there a place to see that? Can you can you share yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, this is, I was just on First Majestic before we started the show. Right. So I'm just looking at, you know, here, but, and you could see here, this is, I think I went here, let me just go out to something like in March or let's go out to April. And when, when we talk about the skew, you know, we're talking about the relative, oops, I mean, I'm on March. We're talking about the relative uh, premium of the strikes, right, versus each other. So we could see here, this is 33 days out. These are the different strikes here. So the top strike, 35 strike. So you see here implied volatility, 189. And I think we closed around 22 versus 162. So you see that as it's going up, as we're going up in strikes, the implied volatility is going up, which is, this is what the, and what this is telling us, what this is indicating is that investors believe if we go up, we're not going up slowly. It's going to accelerate. That's what they're saying. That just like on a downside, sometimes when the market goes down, it accelerates to the downside because of leverage. You know, people have to deleverage. When we see a skew to the upside, like we are seeing it right here, that's, the market indicating that they believe if we continue going up, that it's going to accelerate and go up at a faster clip. Um, so that's just really quickly. Now that this is in first majestic, let's take a look at an SLV. Now, while, while he's doing that, Chris, someone did ask was SLV your only silver play. And I know D was on first majestic because we were talking about it earlier in the day ourselves. You've so, mentioned First Majestic numerous times as well. SLV is not the only way you'd play silver. You've actually mentioned that the miners may have more maybe upside than actually the SLV. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think you've mentioned something like that. Yeah, in fact, I rarely use SLV myself because the flaw to me is that in the outcome that I most expect where – Someday people are going to say, hey, I want my metal. And then it's like, hey, we don't have that. To me, there's some risk. So if I put my trade on an SLV and there is an issue there, then it's you, you were right in the exact situation you bet for, but you're going to lose on your bet or, or at least conceivably lose on your bet. And it's a risk that I hedge out. Uh, Dimitri, actually, could you pull up the AG board again, please? Yeah. And so, just another thing before I move, I'm just showing you, I opened up the open interest here and you could see there's lots of open interest, even going up to the 41 strike, which is the higher, higher strike. And you could see the amount of options just trading. You know, these, these are 53% away. We're talking about options, 52 days to go, 53% out of the money. You see lots of volume, lots of open interest, but let's go back to AG. Will, to touch on your question, yeah, I think there's more upside in the miners. You would expect leverage in the miners. Simple example of that is, uh, you know, I guess I could update my numbers now, but from a few years ago, I use, let's just say, imagine the cost, uh, silver was $15, cost a miner $14 to get it out of the ground. So dollar, the margin is a dollar, right? Make right. sense? Yep. Yeah. So if silver goes from 15 to 20, that's a 33% move. But the, pro the miner, their profit margin went from $1 to $6. So you see where you're getting the leverage on that? Right. Yep. So you're getting the leverage in the stock itself. Right, which is what a lot of people like about them and it's great, but what people don't like is that it's not as correlated as logic might suggest so amazingly, First Majestic last year was trading lower when silver was $27 than when silver was $18. You mentioned that on the previous show, actually. And as you know, now there's a lot of attention being placed on the short position. So it's kind of like a short position stacked on top of a short position, which is on one hand, incredibly glorious, although... The risk to that is during that move from 18 to 27, I didn't have anything on SLV. My option trades were on the miners. So I watched silver go, but I watched my options expire worthless. 
Now, the way I look at it is that if I structure my bet size so that I don't care on any individual individual occasion, whether I win or lose, because I know the math is in my favor, if I'm correct and it is a short squeeze stacked on top of a leverage short squeeze, then when I do hit it, if I hit it, which I hope to, and then possibly we're in the process of first majestic was uh, 12 is up 10 bucks in the last week, I think. So here's a chart just showing what you guys, when, when it really accelerates up, this is the leverage bet, this SLV versus AG, where you see the big spike um, in the stock. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think there's going to be a day where silver will move, but first Majestic will absolutely soar. And I mean, now it's interesting. You have the Reddit short squeeze or whatever you call the media conglomerate that it's morphed into now, talking about silver and first Majestic. So there's a lot of attention. And I don't know, what if... Uh, Dimitri, I have to get going in a minute here, but yeah. um, if maybe if you guys continue or we could think about it and we can discuss next time. Sure. Well, if she, what do you, uh, can you pull up the price chart of First Majestic and look at it was what it was the price a week ago? We get uh, uh, do five days ago. Yeah. Look over here. Oh, you mean the actual price? Yeah. Look not up. the percentage. Uh, here, I'll just look at the history. But you have given me an idea just from this discussion, but you could see here, you know, 13 bucks, 14 bucks. Okay. Don't so give that idea. We'll it. talk about it on our morning show tomorrow, D. D. Uh, so, Chris, is, Chris is, uh, his publicist is uh, texting me right now. He's due on, uh, okay. I don't know, CNBC or CBS or I, I don't know. He's all the big networks are looking. Well, Will, Will, let me just leave you with this. We saw GameStop go from, I think it was 18 bucks a couple of weeks ago to 500. So my parting thought for anyone watching, not saying this will happen and by all means do not take this as legal financial advice. GameStop was 18, First Majestic was 13. And you have any of these options on the board on and First Majestic were to follow a similar trajectory Fun to calculate what those numbers come out like, which, again, maybe trading this and doing it responsibly and in a way that is within people's means is the fun part. But I think it's going to be an incredibly exciting situation. And with that said, thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, you can find me at ArcadiaEconomics.com and on YouTube. And I will look forward to hopefully catching up with you again soon. Hey, Thanks, Chris. Chris. Really appreciate you coming on today. It was really good. Great, right, fellas. Uh, great I appreciate job and what uh, you do. I love this site that you've built. That's what I use myself. And on top of it, which is even far more important, it's really been a pleasure getting to know and become friends with both of you guys the last couple of years. And it's great that people who are looking for a good option education have a place to go and honored to be a part of that and help in any way I can. Awesome, Chris. Listen, we have a show every morning, 9 a.m. live if you ever want to come on, but maybe we can get you on sooner than later. Cool. Let's do it sometime soon. If you need me this week, if things get wild, we'll be there. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. Have a good night. See you in the morning, everyone. Take it easy. Thanks, Chris.